Thank you. Hi, I'm Will. How are you all doing? Are you excited to be in Japan? I'm really excited to be in Japan. This, to me, feels like the home I've never visited because I do logic programming. And what happened in Japan in the 1980s? Does anyone know their history of computing? I'm sure some people here know. The fifth generation computing project. And if you don't know what that is, don't listen to this talk and Google that. No, not really, but you should. You should find out about it. Okay, even better. Pretend it's 1980 and you don't have access to the web because it doesn't exist yet. Uh, but yes, yeah, so it's very exciting to be here. Uh, unfortunately, Dakota Fisher, who is going to give this talk, sends his regrets. I'm sure he's probably on a train right now on the way to Nara, uh, but his flight got delayed. So, has anyone played Slideshow Roulette? No, sorry, not that. Uh, karaoke. Karaoke. We're in Japan. Slideshow karaoke. We're going to do a little bit of that. I know most of the slides. And then what we're really going to do, which is going to be very fun, is we're going to do demo karaoke <laughs> using a scheme I've never used before. Code, which may run on my laptop. Uh, we're going to try doing a demo that, uh, that I've, yeah. According to a, skip, uh, to a script that uh, Dakota just sent me uh, this morning. All right. So uh, to begin my slideshow karaoke, I should point out that uh, some of this research was sponsored by the government, by DARPA, and an NSF career grant that Matt Might has. And these views do not represent that of the government. Uh, I'm in Matt Mites U Combinator Lab at Utah, and Matt uh, Hammer is uh, has his own lab at uh, CU Boulder, uh, uh, and Dakota Fisher is working with with Matt. So, what is this mini adapton thing? Let me just step back, and even though I don't know all the slides perfectly, I do understand the context of the project. So, let me just. Uh, take a second and, and tell you why we decided to do this work at all and why you might be interested. Uh, so first of all, has anyone here heard of a language called Mini Canron? Okay, a bunch of people. Has anyone here tried Mini Canron or played with it? Has anyone here implemented Mini Canron or Micro Canron? Okay, a few people. Uh, so one of the inspirations for this language, uh, Mini Canron, which, which I worked on with uh, Dan Friedman and Oleg Kislyov, and now uh, a number of other people, including some people in this room, one of the inspirations for that language was to have a very, very small logic programming system that anyone could understand, anyone could implement, play with, extend, hack, teach other people, so forth, share with undergrads, whatever, share with hobbyists. And that's been quite successful. And Jason Heeman, who isn't gonna be here for the next talk, uh, worked with Dan Friedman on a system called MicroCanon, which is supposed to be a really, really baby implementation of logic programming. And that's been very successful and it's been you know, ported to maybe 50 host languages at this point. And so, so the idea is if you want to learn logic programming language or logic programming, one way to do it is to get a little implementation, you know, port it to language of your choice, hack it, so forth. And by the time you're done, you'll understand it. The mini adapton that we'll be talking about, and micro adapton, which is like the core that you can build mini adapton on top of, is conceptually the same sort of idea. We want to have a system for incremental co computation, which I'll talk about in a minute, that is accessible to anyone who wants to learn about it. So incremental computation is something that historically has been considered a little exotic or difficult to implement, a little tricky, because uh, we're, we're dealing with with both uh, caching or memoization and side effects, and we have to do all sorts of bookkeeping and so forth. And uh, the, the high quality implemental, uh, incremental computation implementations are quite tricky. And if you try looking at papers and so forth, you'll see there's lots of theoretical work, but there's not so much tutorial reconstruction or things like that. So what we're trying to do is, is make a, a very simple implementation of incremental computing that anyone who knows Scheme, anyone in this room, could take, they could plug
play around with it. They can understand all the code completely, teach it to other people. They can hack it, port it to other la languages and so forth. And we, we hope you will do so. And also I should say that uh, this isn't the last word we think in our implementation. We hope that uh, just like with mini Canron and micro Canron and so forth, over time, based on experience and feedback, we'll figure out how to teach this much better and boil down the implementation even, even more and make it easier to understand. Okay, so that's really the goal. Here's, here's the high level takeaway. If you are interested in how do you combine uh, mutation with memoization, that's something called incremental computation, and the best way to really learn it is to implement it and to play around with that implementation. That's what Mini Adapton is. And we're going to ask you all, if, you're, if you have any interest in this, to check it out. Look at our, uh, the code in the paper. It's completely self-contained. And, and try, try experimenting with it. And uh, we'll even point to a couple things you might do to extend it. Okay? And we're, we're very uh, eager to get any sort of feedback especially on how we can improve the implementation or how we can improve the explanation of the implementation. All right, so let's talk about memoization. So memoization is a great thing. It allows us to make a note, basically, of, of things we've already computed. And one of the classic examples is Fibonacci. So you know, Fibonacci, if we do it in sort of the naive way, it can be exponential. But if we save and remember the, the results that we've computed, the, the, the sub, sub uh, values that, that we've computed, and reuse those, save them in a MEBO table, now we can make it linear time in terms of computation. Great. Well, that's great, except that memoization in general forbids mutation. If once we start having set bang and side effects like that in our language, then we can run into trouble. So here's a simple example of that. The function called max tree, which is just going to take a simple tree, just an S expression representation of a tree, and it's going to just do a simple recursion. So if the tree happens to be a pair, we're going to recur on the car and cutter and take the max of those. Assume we have numbers in the node, uh, the leaves. Uh, otherwise, we just get the value of, of the node back. Here's a simple example of such a tree where our leaves are one through four. And just remember max and scheme. If we give it a bunch of numbers, look at the maximum value. So here's our tree represented with beautiful uh, dots. And in this tree, we get back four, just as we would expect. Okay, nothing special here. This is just vanilla scheme 101 type stuff. All right. So here, here's a little transcript. Uh, we're going to define some tree to be that little simple tree. Uh, and we ask for a max tree of that some tree, we get back four, just as expected. Now the fun begins when we start doing side effects, set cutter. We're gonna set cutter some tree um, to be five. So now if we look at some tree, it's exactly like it was before, except the cutter, the 3.4, is replaced with five instead. Uh, we can ask max of one, two, five. We should get back five. Now, if we ask max tree of some tree, if max tree has um, been memoized, if we're saving the previous result in the table, now we're going to get the wrong result. We're still going to get four, even though now we should get back five. So the problem is we stored the result, but uh, we invalidated basically some information um, that that the results in the table are dependent on. So that's no good. So what is incremental computation? It, it's a technique that allows us to reuse previous results, cached, uh, cached results, just like in memoization, but it allows us to do so in the face of changing inputs. In particular, in the case of, of mini-adapton, in cases where we have uh, mutation. And so Adapton, there's something called Adapton that Matt Hammers worked on for a number of years. Um, and this is the big system. And there, there are a number of papers, and we'll show you some references at the end. Um, but full Adapton is a general language-based approach to incremental computation. And so this has all sorts of bells and whistles, and there's all sorts of very nice theoretical work which describes Adapton. 
and you can you know, go find any number of papers on it. Uh, and so that's fantastic. And how, how does Adapton work? Well, Adapton works by not only just not only keeping track of the values you got from previous computations, but also keeping track of a dependency graph, which um, in Adapton speak is called a DCG, which I always think is definite clause grammar from logic programming, but this is a demanded computation graph. So I'm sure if DCG comes up on the slide again, I will forget what it's called, but it is a demanded computation graph. So that's keeping track of our dependencies. And you might want to think about something like Adapton in terms of other things that we know that allow us to cache results. Okay, so one is in Scheme, we have thunks. Thunks are just procedures of no arguments. And we can, you know, basically they can be internally stored as a, as a closure. And what are their properties? Well, it doesn't avoid recomputation. If you invoke that thunk twice, it has to do the same work twice again. Does it support mutation? Yes, because you're doing all the work again. So if you have a, a side effect somewhere, that's fine. The, the thunk will, will allow you to, to get the correct answer in the, in the presence of mutation. We also have promises. So in Scheme, we have force and delay, if, uh, if you're familiar with those. They allow us to, to get a promise back. And when you force that promise, it, uh, Scheme will cache the result. So if you force the promise again, it doesn't redo the computation. It just gives you the value back. So it's a form of caching. So this will avoid recomputation, but it doesn't support uh, mutation. You can get incorrect results, just as we saw with, with MaxTree. Adapton version of promises, uh, the idea is to combine the best of both worlds. So it will avoid recomputation when that can be done correctly, but at the same time, it will support mutation. So in addition to having an internal representation of a closure, a promise also remembers the result that you had before. And an adapton promise, in addition to remembering the result, also remembers the dependencies in the form of this, this DCG. Okay, why do we you know, need to support mutation? Well, well, you probably all know the answer here. Otherwise, you'd be programming in Haskell. No. Uh, <laughs> maybe I would uh, phrase this question a little bit. But, but in terms of things that, that involve uh, mutation and dependencies, they're tools we use all the time. Like, you know, things like make, spreadsheets, databases, interpreters, and so forth. So, so this idea of, of wanting to be able to, to cache values and still have mutation comes up over and over again. In fact, in several of the talks earlier today, we saw this sort of thing where you want to keep track of dependencies, but maybe things will, will change over time. So this definitely comes up in, in real world programming. What is mini adapton? So this is gonna be our baby version of adapton. It's gonna be much smaller, much, much simpler. And we're opposed to full adapton, which is designed you know, maybe for efficiency and for its formal properties and so forth, we're specifically going to have a version that's designed to be very portable, very small, very readable, and we're willing to sacrifice, you know, maybe other, other properties in order, in order to do so. Uh, and Dakota says, we're also going to try to have it used. Well, we'll see. Currently in the whole world, there's one user, Dakota, who's not here. Uh, so hopefully we can improve on that. Uh, and then try to be abused. Yes, so we're going to try to abuse this thing. All right, so now this is the visualization of Max Tree. Hopefully we can make sense of this. So we start out, and uh, we're making a call to Max Tree of some tree. If you remember before, some tree was just the variable we defined that had the tree with the cons pair 1.2 and 3.4 inside another cons pair. Okay, so that's some tree, that's that variable. Okay, and so when we make this call, we have to look up the variable. Okay, so we look up some tree, fine, get its value. And that will basically allow us to say, okay, well, that's the same as max tree of the concrete value, and the value we looked up for the variable. And now we're going to do the recursion on the car. So that gives us the call of max tree 1.2. And that, in turn, will lead to another uh, recursion on the car. 
And finally, we get down to a leaf. So a max tree of one will be one. And once we start working on the critters, we end up with this sort of picture. Okay, so this is a standard you know, tree recursion thing. There's nothing special here. Until we get into the mutation case. So at this point, now we've mutate some tree. Okay, so we've done our set cutter bang on some tree, set cutter uh, some tree to be five. So this red means that this part of the tree is dirty. So this part, this is our you know, uh, DCG. So our graph now has a dirty node in it. So that means that when it's time to, to ask for a new value back, you know, what, what is max tree now? Uh, we can't just return the previous value, which was four. Now we're gonna have to, to sort of trace our dependencies and, and see what's, you know, basically have these dependencies flow through. So, so some tree is dirty. That means that max tree of some tree also has to become dirty, sort of infects it. And that means that we break off this part of the, the tree. So the, this part of the computation is gonna have to be redone. Um, and in particular, now when we look up uh, the sum tree variable, we get the new value of sum tree. But importantly, when we recur on the car of this value, guess what? We already have that value around. So we can reuse that and this, this part of the subtree. When we recur on the cutter, that computation has to be new. So we get some sharing. So we get some benefit here. We don't have to do, redo this part of the computation. And at the same time, we maintain correctness in the, process, in the presence of uh, mutation. Okay. Uh, so what does one of these nodes look like in, this, in the DCG? Well, we have to keep track of some information. Um, so we have some fields in this record type. And in particular, we have things like, is the node clean? So that was that red that you saw. Is the node clean? If not, we're going to have to uh, do a little more work and clean it up. And we have super and sub computations. We have the result that we had seen before. So, so there are a few fields. Here's the thunk that represents uh, computation, I guess. Um, but you can see this is a relatively small data structure. There's not that much going on. Now, of course, once you start getting into mutation, it can get a little tricky. You don't need a whole lot of moving parts to be tricky. But you can see that the, re the record type is relatively small and simple. Um, okay, so as far as the interface, mini adapton has a slightly different interface than micro adapton, which uh, it's built on top of or can be built on top of. The main idea that we have in mini adapton is, is what uh, Dakota likes to call a thunks. So we have thunks, but now we have adapton thunks. So these are thunks that, that uh, basically know about mutation, uh, but also uh, can, can reuse some of their results. Okay, so it's better than a regular thunk because it can, it can do some caching, but it's also safe with respect to, to side effects. And we also have references to the thunks, which are AREFs, which my understanding is the AREFs part is, is a little bit new with respect to standard adapton. Uh, and Dakota, who will be around for the West, rest of the week, hopefully um, can can tell you a little bit more about what's new with AREFs if you, if you can uh, pigeonhole him. Uh, but you can see the interface is relatively, relatively small in terms of what you can do with uh, these, these uh, references. And of course, adapton force is sort of our big hammer when we want to re redo the computation. And we also have uh, the ability to define uh, memoized functions or adapton memoized functions. And we have a notion of an adapton uh, variable. And we have a few operators in that. So that's the entire interface. Um, and you can use this interface in relatively sophisticated ways to, to build up all sorts of types of computation. And now it's the interface demo. Okay. So, this is where it really gets fun. I've never used Guile before. Uh, this is Guile if you haven't seen it. So let's see. Uh, 
I'm not exactly sure what the demo is supposed to show. So let's see if we can figure out what, why he's showing us this stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna copy this. Hey, that worked, great. This may stop working at any time, just gonna warn you. Oh, okay, good. Uh, all right, I think I understand what it's doing so far. <laughs> let, let me know if you get confused. Uh, all right, so let's see. We're gonna define R1 to be an adapton ref. Great, ref one, uh, okay. I don't know what the one means. R1 is an R6RS record. Okay, I guess that's what we were just looking at. And now we're, oh, I see. So one is literally the, the value that R1 should have. So we're gonna force it, just like forcing a thunk, and we get back one. That's the value, great. Now we're gonna set R1 to be five. Awesome. And now let's see, is it really true that when we force it, we'll get back five? Yes, okay. So I guess that's working in face of mutation. Fantastic. All right, what is T1? Uh, what is that? Any guesses? Define T1 to be adapt plus two of adapt on force R1. So if we force R1, currently R1 should be five. We're gonna add seven to it. So we're gonna adapt that to be T1, okay. Uh, I don't know, it's in a... The next time I think it's adapt on force T1. Okay. Oh, did I skip one? Oh, okay. All right, so let's see. Well, well, are we allowed to force it now? Oh yeah, we are supposed to force it now. So it's, okay, now we get seven. Okay, that makes more sense. All right, good. All right, so now we're gonna set R1 to be negative five. All right. Okay, so if it's negative five, then we're gonna add two to negative five. So that should be negative three. Okay, oh, okay. Supposedly it's gonna be negative three. Let's see if it really is. I guess the code is working. Okay, cool, uh, okay, now look. Now we get to the max tree. So here's the memoized version of max tree. I guess this is the good stuff here. So let's make that a little easier to read. Okay, so what is this code doing? If T is an adapton, then we're calling max tree, but we're also doing some forcing here, okay. Now, so now we have three cases instead of two. So before, okay, so the la this, these last two clauses, I think are identical to our previous definition of max tree. So the part that's new is this adapton test in the, the first case, in that case, we're doing an adapton force and making and calling max tree on that. All right, so that I guess is our special sauce is that first clause. So let's see if we can define T2 to be adapton ref cons four to T1, all right. So T1 was the thing that gave us the negative three. Yeah, it's currently negative three, great. All right, max tree of T2. Oh, that's right. Now we're gonna do the adapton set. Okay, so here's where it gets interesting, I guess. We're gonna set T2 to be 100 instead of this pair. The bafton reps, ref set, okay. And now I guess we're gonna force it again. Okay, so I guess it works, yeah. All right, so proof, or maybe not. Okay, so um, <laughs> uh, yeah. 
That's it. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 you see why I decided to take the chance to do the live demo. Okay. <laughs> All right, so apparently it works. That's our claim it works. Uh, Dakota defied you to break it. He will pay you up to no money if you find an error in it. Uh, so what what is Adapton? What is incremental computing? What is mini Adapton? So Adapton, a mini Adapton is Adapton implemented in a more minimal form. Yeah, I know. Uh, a minimal implementation encourages hackability. Well, yeah. And ah, you can play with it right now. Okay. If you so desire, that is true. You can play with it right now. We want you to use this as soon as possible. <laughs> play with this. It's getting a little desperate. <laughs> this is the toy we made is neat, and everyone should play with it. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so so Dakota really wants you to play with it. There's an implementation on GitHub. It works, we think. Uh, I am sure that the code can be made nicer. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to clean up the code as much as we can, but as we learned with Mini Canrin, we could work on it for 10 years and still keep cleaning it up. So so I, I don't think Mini or Micro Adapton are anywhere close to to how clean they could be. And our explanation is still new. So you know, this is something where we want to keep revising this paper and this code and try to make incremental computing really simple, really easy to use, and something that people can easily extend and hack uh, and play around with. OK, a few challenges if you're interested in playing around with incremental computing uh, with the mini Adapton. One thing that mini Adapton currently doesn't do that full Adapton does is it mini Adapton um, doesn't check to see if a changed subcomputation produces the same result as it did before. So for example, uh, think about the square function, okay? So if I square two, I get four. And say I set bang that two to make it negative two. If I square negative two, I still get four. So if I had uh, a DCG, my, my computation graph, depending on that value of you know, the square of, of this number, it turns out that set banging two to be negative two should give me the same result. And Adapton, full Adapton will actually check that. Mini Adapton doesn't. So that's a challenge. You could try adding that feature. Our debugging information might be described as non-existent. You could improve that. Visualization, things like that. And of course, uh, porting it to other languages. Using mini Adapton. Okay, so using mini Adapton in anger, I guess, for something would be good. I don't know what this means, Adapton data structures or Adapton for... Okay, actually, for interactive applications, this I do know. And this this goes back to, to uh, Daniel's talk, for example. Uh, one of the things I know that Matt Hammer is very interested in is using incremental computation for doing things like text editors or doing interactive computation. So, so if you really want to make something feel interactive, if you're doing significant computation, something like caching or memoization really is necessary. Uh, so, so this is a perfect use for something like Adapton or Mini Adapton. And you know, often it's the case if you're doing interactive computation that there might be some sort of mutation in there. So, so this, this, I think, is actually a really interesting application. Try, try to use mini Adapton uh, for doing interactive computation, interactive applications. Uh, sort of higher level, I think this may be, oh, okay, so uh, just, just to point out a couple of pieces of related work. So first of all, we wanted to thank uh, Dan and Jason, I think. Is Jason here? No. Okay, uh, we wanted to thank uh, Dan and Jason for their work on MicroCanron, which really inspired the, the Micro Adapton work. Uh, that, that was really cool. And if you want to look at the history of incremental com uh, computation, one good paper is this Popple 1986 paper uh, by uh, uh, Bill Pugh and uh, Teitelbaum. And you know, here, here are the, 
here's the website for the Adapton paper, adapton.org. Uh, and you can learn more about this, this sort of more general view of computing called self-adjusting uh, computation that uh, Mudakar has been working on. Um, yeah, okay. And I'll just, I'll just say one other thing that's kind of motivated this project. Um, so our, sort of our bigger goal is to try to understand what are the connections between things like incremental computing and adapton and other types of memoization and, and caching. So for example, in logic programming, there's something known as tabling. In fact, Ramana Kumar and I <laughs> spent part of a summer writing a tabling system for Mini Kendron. And tabling has a well-deserved reputation for being extremely difficult to implement, as we found out firsthand. Uh, but tabling, in some sense, is just a form of memoization. It's, it's an advanced form of memoization. It has to deal with some issues with logic programming. But once you look at tabling, once you look at things like incremental computing, self-adjusting computation, and even looking at things like abstract interpretation, you start seeing the same themes over and over and over again. So our, our current thinking is that there are probably some deep connections here between these different types of computation, and we want to understand those better. So right now, we, you know, we have, in the logic programming realm, mini Canron, micro Canron. Uh, for incremental computing, we have mini adapton, micro adapton. One thing that Dakota is working on now is trying to figure out can we come up with a simpler version of tabling for mini Canron, like a tabling for micro Canron, maybe, or something like that. And at that point, maybe we can start understanding better what some of these connections are between these forms of computation look similar. And once again, looking at things like um, uh, abstract interpretation, actually, which uh, Tom Gilray uh, is, is looking at in the context of, of Mini Canron. Um, so so those, are, those are sorts of the, the connections that, uh, that we're looking at. And hopefully, by having a bunch of small, easily hackable in implementations all implemented in the same language, it'll make it easier for us to, to, to make those comparisons. I should point out that Nick Labix also looking at the um, abstract interpretation for mini Canon. But anyway, so that's the broader research agenda. And so this is one part of it, but it has the nice side effect that you know, one thing we, we can hopefully give to the scheme community is this very easily understandable, easily hackable, easily implementable version of incremental computation that you can play with. And I hope, I hope uh, it will it'll be something you want to look at and we'll go on to become as you know, popular as something like micro -cannon. Uh, I don't think there's an explicit table. I think, well, I, I think there's, you know, this, this uh, DCG structure, which is, you know, a graph, and the nodes of the graphs remember the values, but it, it's not like a, you know, it's not like just like a regular table, like you'd have, like, for tabling, we implemented something that was probably closer to, to an actual table where but you know, like remember it. Oh, space leaks. Oh, space leaks, space leaks, yeah. Yeah, I guess the garbage collector kicks in, hopefully. Yeah. Now, I... I if you had a normal sort of memorization table, you have to be very careful that you've not put in answers that you're never going to be asking for. That's right. So, so my understanding a, a, is that, you know, the garbage collector takes care of it because the graph, you know, the nodes get disconnected and all that. If you really want to understand that better, you could ask Matt Hammer, for example, or, or Dakota when he's here. But I think the... Um, Hopefully some of the papers on Adapton itself would discuss those issues. That's a good question. Ramana. How is it different from spreadsheets or spreadsheet implementation techniques? Great question. So in the paper, 
Our example is a spreadsheet. <laughs> now, now why? So I guess your question is, why not just use the spreadsheet technology? Like, what does this give you? Or that's a good question. I don't know. I, I don't. I haven't uh, implemented you know some sophisticated spreadsheet, and and I don't know how they track all the dependencies internally. It may be that if you pulled apart, you know, Excel or whatever, you would see something like Adapton inside of it. And in that sense, like maybe yeah, they are roughly the same and just we've pulled it out for you and made it nice and clean. Uh, but, but I don't know. And, and that's something that Matt Hammer, I think, could, could, could answer better. Uh, certainly, you can use Adapton to do things like spreadsheets. I can tell you that Matt has done some more recent work where he's made extensions to this basic approach that I think go beyond what is usually seen in a spreadsheet, maybe what a spreadsheet is normally concerned with. So he's got something called nominal adapton, and you know, he's figuring out, I think, different ways to cache things that normally wouldn't be cached. So, so I think the idea here is to have a general framework where you can explore incremental computation in different ways and easily extend it. So that's, that's one of the goals, and obviously for a spreadsheet, the goal isn't to, to have a framework for extending incremental computation, but um, now an interesting project would be, okay, could you take something like Mini Adapton and build like a decent spreadsheet on top of it? I don't know, but it seems like that would be a good exercise. Yeah? yeah you know, functional purity apart, I wonder if, if one would really use a mutation of objects and uh, not have a spreadsheet, for instance. I would tend to think that people would use a uh, you know a first class representation of edits uh, because you also need to have undo for instance in the spreadsheet. So to me that hints to a different mechanism, not just object mutation. Okay, so so this is this is a good question. This this is one I anticipated. Are you a Haskeller? No, I'm not. No, you're not. Okay. All right, but, but the, the, the question I thought that you know, all the Haskell programmers and all the closure programmers would be say, why do you need mutation to begin with? It's horrible, get rid of it, you know. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's a reasonable question to ask. Uh, and then for a spreadsheet, I'm sure you could do a purely functional implementation of spreadsheets. I guess maybe the bigger, the bigger answer is, uh, you know, we still haven't figured out how to do all forms of computation efficiently without mutation. I'd make that, make that claim, and that therefore it's useful to have, to have uh, frameworks for exploring this sort of thing. The other thing I'll say is that I think that the, the broader view of incremental computation isn't just to look at mutation. Now, now in this case, we've looked at mutation, but what it really is, is what happens when an input changes? That's another way to look at it. Say, say I make a call to a function, and now I make another call to the function that's somewhat different, where memo, or sorry, normal memoization wouldn't be able to recognize the similarities. So in that case, you could do something that really is pure. How much of this graph can you reuse? How much of the dependency stuff can you use? You know, and, and I guess, you know, in some sense, how much of, of all the book, bookkeeping we're doing to keep track of dependencies and when things are clean and all that, how much of that infrastructure can be reused? Because you know, notions of dependency graphs come up all the time, for example, right? So, so maybe at the heart of this is, is, is a deeper notion of dependency graphs and, and management of dependency graphs and that that should be sort of a core, a core piece that every programmer has so if they want to do you know, things like make or whatever, they can just grab some component and, and get the fee functionality for free, I don't know. Or, or a tracing JIT might be a good example. A tracing JIT? Maybe it might be able to just recompile just a subset of what's in. Yeah, yeah, I think there are lots of con uh, connections with things like tracing JITs as well, absolutely. Yeah. Can we have I.O. operations in incremental computing? Can you have I.O. implement, in, in, uh, Operations and incremental computation. That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Matt Hammer could answer that, but if you can't, I'd want to know why. It seems like you should, right? Uh, so, so I don't know. So I'm a newbie. I, I, I'm a newbie to incremental computation, and like I said, 
you know, my real thing is I want to figure out what the connection is with things like tabling and logic programming. But this is, a, you know, in logic programming, this is also an issue. What does input and output mean in logic programming? That's, that's been a very tricky issue. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if I.O. is also tricky in incremental computing. So I, I think uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I will, I will ask Matt, uh, or you can email him yourself. I don't know the answer. Yes? Okay, so, so the question is for, for dynamic programming like Dijkstra's uh, algorithm, can, can you, would that map on to something like Adapton nicely? And my understanding is that that's the intent, is that you'd be able to write things like, you know, like dynamic programming algorithms in a straightforward way. Now, I haven't done it personally, um, but, but I know that that's the sort of thing that Matt is interested in. So uh, I don't think we've implemented it in mini Adapton. Uh, maybe it's been impl implemented in Adapton, I'm not sure. But, but I think your intuition is exactly right, that that's exactly the sorts of things that incremental computing is, is aiming to be able to do. So, um, so I, I, I guess one place to look would be these papers you know, on the Adapton project and self-adjusting computation. If you look at the examples, they have lots of examples like spreadsheets and interpreters and things like that that, uh, um, that would at least give you some sense of the sorts of programs that people are using it, the full Adapton for. Sorry, what is the what? Oh, what is the tabling problem? That sounds like offline discussion. <laughs> okay, I'll, we'll take that offline. Right. Thank you. Have we heard from Jason at all? <laughs>